All right. Well, first and foremost, um, thank you uh, to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to, to have you all here for the kickoff and, and are looking forward to the important work that we're really all gonna be doing together um, over this coming academic year. Uh, quick roadmap for today. Um, after a small welcome, um, we are gonna dive into um, talks from three guests. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our state, um, our university, and the importance of, of our work um, here on the advisory council. Um, after that, we're gonna break into some small groups um, so that we can reflect and discuss what we heard uh, from our guests this morning, and then use the remainder of our time together um, to give a, a little history, kind of how we got here, talk about how we plan to, to do our work together um, and what our immediate next steps will be as we look ahead to the next meeting. Um, so uh, for those who haven't had a chance to already, we do have one ask um, in, in the Zoom. Uh, if you'd be able to please update your name and Zoom to add your pronouns. Um, you can do that by opening the participant um, list. From there, um, you should hopefully see your name usually at the top, or hopefully not too hard to find. If you hover over your name with, with your cursor, um, you'll see an option for more. You can select more and then select um, rename. And then from there, you can update your name to add your pronouns. So please keep your name and then add, add the pronouns after that. While you're all doing that, you'll probably see a very long list of people. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we don't really have time, unfortunately, to go around and do introductions for everyone, but we at least wanted to take a second um, to give a quick um, overview uh, of everyone that we have on the call. We have our um, members of our advisory council, as well as all the members of our, our student subcommittee joining us today, um, our speaking guests, and then um, some additional guests um, who help support our speakers. So we also have Eden Inouye-Rani from the provost office, Alex Pierce from Vice Chancellor Heller's office, um, and Alan Fish from um, Facilities Planning and Management. Um, and then of course myself and other members of the Office of Sustainability and the Office of Strategic Consulting who helped um, organize this whole show. Just a few last things uh, before we get going. Um, one, I wanna start um, and acknowledge that we are using technology, uh, which means that we may at one point be at the whims of that technology. So there's always the possibility that there could be a glitch uh, here or there. Um, so we ask for a little latitude ahead of time just in case anything were to happen. Uh, in terms of ground rules uh, that we'd like to all hold ourselves accountable to, um, one, um, we encourage you to keep, keep your video on um, throughout the meeting. Um, two, please mute yourself um, whenever you are not talking um, so we can limit background noise. Um, in terms of how we use Zoom, um, the chat feature is a great option if you're having any technical issues or, or concerns, or if there's any resources or links that you'd like to share during the discussion, um, Nathan Yandel from our office will be monitoring the chat so he'll be able to jump in and respond as needed. And then the other feature to, to call out is the raise hand feature. So you can find that in the participant list if there um, is a moment when you would like to speak and someone else is speaking to avoid crosstalk and, and uh, confusing speak on, on Zoom, please use the raise hand feature. And we'll find the time to, to bring you in. And then lastly, and maybe most importantly, I wanna acknowledge that in our members on the council, on the student subcommittee, and in, in our guests, for with everyone on, the, on this, this meeting, we have a great range of experiences. Experiences on campus, experiences addressing and thinking about issues of sustainability, experiences with the process of strategic planning, and experiences with you know, using Zoom and, and participating in these kind of virtual meetings. Um, so we wanna make sure we all give ourselves some permission uh, to be a little unpolished uh, in this space, especially when we break out into our small discussions and as we have future meetings, um, we're asking you to, to come and be comfortable best you can providing your thoughts and opinions, even if they're half thoughts and half opinions. Um, and that we will all also respect and honor each other's different perspectives so that hopefully we can together create a kind of virtual collaboration space and at the end produce something that we, we hope is both bigger and better than the sum of, of all of our parts here. Uh, so with that, I'm all done um, and I have the, um, we'll hand it off to, to Missy here who will introduce our next speaker.
Yeah, we are incredibly privileged and honored to have Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes with us today to help us kick off this endeavor. Um, as sir, he's serving as the 45th Lieutenant Governor and was elected on November 8, 2018. He is the first African American to serve as Lieutenant Governor in Wisconsin and the second African American to ever hold statewide office, which absolutely floored me. Born and raised in Milwaukee, Lieutenant Governor Barnes is the son of a public school teacher and a United Auto Workers member to whom he credits much of his success. He grew up attending Milwaukee Public Schools and graduated from John Marshall High School in 2003. Lieutenant Governor Barnes attended Alabama A&M University and after his time there, he worked for various political campaigns and in the city of Milwaukee mayor's office, eventually becoming an organizer for Milwaukee Inner City Congregations Allied for Hope a Milwaukee-based interfaith coalition that advocates social justice. In 2012, at the age of 25, Lieutenant Governor Barnes was elected to the Wisconsin State Assembly, where he served two terms. His tenure in the State Assembly included serving as chair of the legislature's Black and Latino Caucus and becoming a recognized leader on progressive economic policies and gun violence prevention legislation. Within his current role, Lieutenant Governor Barnes serves as the chair of the governor's task force on climate change, while also serving as co-chair of the New Deal Climate Change Policy Group. The New Deal is a national network of rising state and local elected leaders. The Lieutenant Governor uses a platform of sustainability and equity to fight for solutions that invest in opportunities and fairness for every child, person, and family in Wisconsin, regardless of zip code. Lieutenant Governor? All right, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, to be back, albeit virtually, at the, uh, at the uh, UW School of Sustainability. Um, it's really important now that we think about these issues uh, more than ever. Um, our work in prioritizing and implementing uh, sustainability efforts uh, at this point is gonna be critical, but it will only work if we do this work together. So again, thank you, Missy, for the wonderful introduction and all the work that you're doing in leading this office uh, of sustainability at our flagship institution here in the state. Again, everybody, I'm Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes and so honored uh, to be kicking off the work of the UW Sustainability Advisory Council. Now, the work of this council is incredibly urgent and important as we are losing out on time to start making the necessary changes to the way that we operate within institutions of higher education and business and government agencies also across the state. And that's why I'm excited to see UW bringing together people from across the spectrum, from across the institution, from students and alumni, to faculty, to staff, to your executive leadership, to take on the challenge of making UW-Madison a force for sustainability. We need our campuses to be leaders in this movement, and you're proving it right now. And in my time as Lieutenant Governor, and before this pandemic, I had an opportunity to travel all across the state. We had all 72 counties in, in, in our first year in office. And Many of those trips were unfortunately storm damage trips. And we saw the devastating impacts that climate change is having on communities all across Wisconsin. There are extreme weather events uh, that are occurring more regularly, more often, these 100 year storms that seem to be biennial storms and historic levels of flooding all across Wisconsin. We see people in rural communities, especially our farmers, who are losing their livelihoods, people whose communities are being polluted, but they have no way to relocate their family to a healthier, or a safer place. And unfortunately, Wisconsin has fallen tremendously behind in addressing issues of climate change. And that's why we're taking Wisconsin in a completely new direction. We committed from day one to embracing the science and making our state a leader in tackling climate change. Those are my very first words uh, on election night when I took the stage. I said, we're bringing science back. And uh, I hope that we are doing the state proud in doing so. And the first act officially uh, that we did to address climate change was rejoining or excuse me was joining the u.s climate alliance and vowing to uphold the tenets of the paris climate accord and governor evers then signed executive order number 38 which created the office of sustainability and clean energy which set a goal of ensuring that all electricity consumed in the state is 100 percent carbon free by 2050 if not sooner because we know that we need to do this much quicker than we thought that we needed to do because of failures at the federal level and this office is leading our enterprise-wide sustainability efforts. And it's also working to make positive changes in all the areas that we have control over. And things like 
our vehicle or state vehicle fleet, for instance, how our agencies use resources and recycle the energy efficiency of state buildings. And they're working to develop and implement a clean energy plan for our state, which will consist of bringing together agencies and stakeholders to figure out the quickest path to meet our carbon free goals. Now, Governor Evers also created the task force on climate change, and I'm very fortunate to have been named chair of that task force. We started by assembling a diverse broad coalition of task force members, people from all across the state. We engaged over a thousand members of the public through virtual listening sessions that informed our work. We spent task force meetings engaging with people working on climate issues, people who've been doing this work since before we took office, since before the prior administration that took us backwards. These are people who have been committed and dedicated this work and dedicated to this work and waiting for an opportunity uh, to, to, to further develop their research, to further uh, exercise their efforts as well. And this includes rural farmers to urban agriculture groups. And by bringing together uh, so many people to the table, we're able to craft policies that address the many areas of the climate crisis. Uh, but we know that there will be so much more work that still needs to get done. We know that this task force is obviously not gonna solve every problem, but this is one well, small or large piece, no matter how, depends on how you wanna think about it. But we also made sure to center environmental justice. Uh, and also we wanted to facilita facilitate uh, discussions about systemic issues like racism at every step of the way, regardless of who we were having those conversations with, because for far too long, we see our lower income communities. We see our communities of color uh, experiencing the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Uh, and these are communities that have had the most uh, minute role in, in, in making climate change uh, the reality that it is. Uh, and we know that these environmental justices contribute to even more severe racial inequities in health and in well being uh, that continue to plague this state, that continue to plague this country. And these inequities have been further exposed by the pandemic. And so we have been very intentional about making sure that we include people in the conversations that haven't traditionally been a part of those conversations. Uh, as we know, our indigenous communities have led this work uh, for far too long and have been faced with so much opposition, uh, but haven't always been uh, recognized or included in the conversations uh, to move us forward to come up with the most effective and impactful climate solutions. And we engaged all of our members in discussions, uh, no matter who they were uh, or what their background was and there were people uh, who you know just didn't have an idea that this was going on people who had been involved in in climate work that didn't realize uh, some of the other things that were going on outside of uh, their purview that were going on outside of their orbit and it was very you know interesting uh, to have the follow-up conversations about these issues uh, but we know that this work has not been done at the state level before in Wisconsin, and we know that it is overdue. We are playing, uh, we're playing a game of catch up right now, but I do believe that with the efforts of uh, this administration, efforts of the, uh, of the UW systems, especially uh, the UW Madison campus, uh, we can do the work that we need to do. We can answer the call in a very real and substantive way. Uh, I don't think we have an option at this point uh, but we've always met great challenges. And I think that this is a chance for us to prove ourselves once again, not just for the state, not just for this country. Wisconsin can be a global leader. Uh, we can be recognized for something, uh, for something good once again, as we have traditionally been. Uh, so I'm proud of the priorities that we made uh, in the task force. But like I said, there's still so much work to do uh, to continue the path to achieving true environmental justice and turning our policy discussions into a reality, uh, not just for us, for the next generation. This isn't the work that we do for ourselves or for our own families. It's about uh, what other people in our community, in our society uh, need, for, quite frankly, to survive. So as we work as a state to implement more equitable and more sustainable solutions, I'm glad that you all are focused on this work. The reach of UW extends across the state, it extends across the globe. Um, I can't think of, I can't even tell you how many times when I was in Madrid for the UN climate conference, uh, conference last December, uh, how many times UW Madison came up in conversations. Uh, so you have a you have a um, reputation to uphold. It is a solid reputation, and we want to be uh, helpful in making sure that you maintain that. And we got to remember that setting these energy goals and doing this work isn't about feeling good about ourselves. Like I said, the work isn't for ourselves. It's also not about feeling good about ourselves. Or it's not about just being on the right side of history either. It's about fighting for our lives and the lives of our children, their children, 
because we owe it to them uh, for the failures uh, of the past and some of the failures of our own generation. So if we want to build a nation uh, where powering our lives doesn't come at the cost of our planet, we need to prioritize, uh, again, equity and sustainability in all of our institutions and in all of our decision making as well. And again, I just can't thank you enough for your commitment to this work. I can't thank you for uh, the great work that I know you're going to do in years to come because we are going to uh, have a state, we're going to have a nation uh, that reaps the benefits and will be much, much, much better off as a result. So again, thank you for having me and congrats on all the amazing work. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Um, you are more than welcome to stay. I also know you have a very busy agenda. <laughs> Provost Schultz and Vice Chancellor Heller have a few remarks and we, we, if you're available, we'd love. But I wish I could. I have to hit the uh, road. I have to. We got to. I got to go to the Capitol. Well, kudos on the flannel. Nothing says Wisconsin like flannel. So, thank, <laughs> thank you, you again for your time here. Thank you. All right, we're going to turn it over to Kathy, who's going to introduce Provost Schultz. Missy, thank you for passing the torch to me, and Carl. Oh, it's my pleasure both to welcome you and to briefly introduce you to those here. Although you probably don't need any introduction, I will still do my best here. I want to start by saying that more than one student has asked me, what's a provost, Kathy? And I don't think anybody here needs the explanation, but I realize this is recorded. And I do want to say that our provost is our chief academic officer. There's another way of saying that. I think the title goes Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. In either case, Carl, you are our provost. We're also yours. And again, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. There's one more thing I want to say. You are also our provost in another sense. You're one of our own. You came to us as the Dean of the College of Letters and Science. You were a named professor in the uh, Department of Economics. I think you did a spell as the director of the Institute for Research on Poverty. And I have a hunch you have been also around the country, including the Department of the Treasury, doing various and sundry things. I think there are few who have a track record second to yours, perhaps none. But I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you again for being with us. And Provost Carl, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Well, Kathy, you are way, 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 way too kind. So thank you very, very much for that introduction. Uh, my favorite definition of provost uh, is on dictionary.com. So sure enough, go there and you read down the definitions. And finally, at the bottom, they have one that says prison warden. <laughs> And uh, I'll admit there are a day or two that it feels like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, thank you, Kathy, for the very kind introduction. And hello, everybody. Um, I want to give a shout out to Lieutenant Governor Barnes for his remarks. And I want to thank everyone for being here, wherever you may be uh, right now. I also would like to take a moment to uh, especially welcome the presence of all the students in the meeting today. As I understand it, when the Sustainability Initiative Task Force came together over 10 years ago, there was initially only one formal student representative on the task force. We now have three student representatives on the advisory council, but in addition, we have an all student subcommittee composed of both undergraduates and graduate students that will be deeply engaged in this work. And you'll be building on a very long legacy in the state of Wisconsin and UW-Madison, which have, as you probably know, deep roots in the sustainability movement, including the legacies of environmental pioneers such as John Muir, Aldo Leopold, and Gaylord Nelson. But there are names of some accomplished but not as well-known scholars uh, that are as important. And here I would include Ada Deer, who has had a remarkable career as a scholar and activist for Native American causes. Frances Hammerstrom, a pioneer in wildlife con conservation. And Angie Kumling Maine, a prominent naturalist. You'll be part of an important tradition. And so I'm thrilled that so many of you are willing to play an integral part. 
In preparation for this kickoff meeting, I looked at the UW-Madison Sustainability Initiative Task Force report from October 2010. It seems it's hard to believe that it was completed 10 years ago. That campus task force did an excellent job laying the foundation for the important work that has been taking place over these past years, led recently by Missy Nurgard and Kathy Middlecamp, along with others. A statement from the cover letter from the former campus leaders struck me. It said, we endorse wholeheartedly the task force vision for UW-Madison to be a living model for sustainability, exemplifying values and actions that demonstrate our commitment to stewardship of resources, respect for place, and the health and well being of the broader community now and for the future. I really can't say it better than this. You and we will learn together. I want to say a bit more about learning the academic side of sustainability. There are many different ways to learn. Kathy Middlecamp and colleagues have done a wonderful job of building opportunities for at least three that I want to highlight. First, many of us learn from experience. Sustainability initiatives on campus have provided a wonderful platform for experiential learning, whether through solar panel installation, adoption of energy efficient lighting, recyclable materials in the dining halls, or countless other examples of student generated innovations that require inspiration, planning, knowledge acquisition, execution, that is learning. A second approach is to learn from others. The work of Kathy and colleagues have, from my perspective, been exemplary as teams of students form durable bonds developing and executing mission-driven projects to support campus and beyond. There have been wonderful opportunities for students to learn from faculty and staff in academic units, in multiple divisions within FPNM, and other divisions such as university housing and the union. As a college professor, I cannot, of course, omit a third pillar, the learning that occurs in the classroom. Sustainability provides a canvas that is not yet fully painted, but there are vast opportunities to link environmental policy, economics, political thought, climate science, core physical, biological, and mathematical sciences with potentially deep ties to the arts and humanities as we grapple with the question, what does it mean to be human and what are our responsibilities to each other and to the planet? I trust the council will think both about the academic, that is the learning side of sustainability, as well as the critical operational issues. Your efforts will also be a wonderful manifestation of the Wisconsin idea, the notion that research and scholarship of the institution can serve the greater good beyond the walls of the campus. Now this advisory council has a broad encompassing charge. The Sustainability Advisory Council will provide recommendations to the provost and the vice chancellor for finance and administration on how to align the university's mission, current campus strategic plans, the 2010 Sustainability Initiative Task Force report, the second nature resilience commitment in our legacy of resource stewardship to advance sustainability at UW-Madison. We are counting on you to help us make important lasting progress. And Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration, Lauren Heller, and I are very much looking forward to the Advisory Council's observations and recommendations. So I'll thank each of you for agreeing to serve on this Advisory Council. And now let me give Vice Chancellor Heller the opportunity to say a few words of welcome too. Cool. Uh, thanks so much, Carl. Uh, and thanks so much to Missy and Kathy and the whole sustainability office uh, for putting this together for us. Uh, my sincere thanks to all of you for being here uh, today and for agreeing to participate in this important work. Um, man, I don't know how I drew the short straw and have to talk after Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Uh, what an amazing, amazing speaker and uh, committed uh, activist in this space. Uh, and then after Professor Middlecamp and Missy and uh, Provost Schultz, I'm like, who am I? I'm just like uh, the, the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Admin over here. Like, so, you know, what do I do as the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Admin? You know, uh, I'm unlike Carl, I'm not a prison warden. Uh, I, uh, you know, 
I am in charge of finance and administration, and that's a big bucket of stuff. Uh, you know, it, it includes, uh, importantly, I think here, facilities and finance. Uh, and, you know, other parts of our sort of administrative strategy. Uh, I'm really lucky and, uh, uh, you know, personally uh, honored and humbled a little bit to know that the Office of Sustainability jointly reports to me, uh, along with the provost. Uh, that's something I take really, really seriously. Uh, you know, all of you will know this much better than I do. Uh, this is so important. This is not a series of issues uh, or a time where we can wait uh, or, you know, take half measures or kind of think through, geez, you know, maybe we should do something about that next year. Uh, you know, no, this is work that needs to be done yesterday. It needs to be done yesterday. Uh, I'm really uh, thankful for all of your work. I'm thankful too for our governance groups, uh, you know, who helped to highlight this whole effort and the stuff that we're doing here together. I think all of our governance groups passed motions asking for the administration to move on sustainability stuff. And, uh, you know, the work in the last couple of years has flowed from that. That's governance in action. That's the Wisconsin idea. That's stuff that we uh, care about and love. Uh, you know, it, it pains me a little bit uh, to hear Lieutenant Governor Barnes, you know, talk about the fact that we've fallen behind. Uh, you know, I think in the real world, we have to admit that. Uh, we have fallen behind where we should be. Uh, there is more we can do. Uh, and different people might see that different ways, right? Like uh, some people would look at that and say, oh, geez, we're behind. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to, you know, uh, let me run away from that problem. You know, uh, other people say, geez, we're behind, maybe that means there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, maybe that means there are things that I can do that would make a difference and actually push this thing forward. Uh, I know you folks are here because you're that kind of person. Uh, you know that you can make a difference, you can really move things forward, and you can. Uh, here's your opportunity to do that, right? So we have all the tools we need. Uh, you know, the history of sustainability uh, from an academic perspective, from a research perspective, uh, from a facilities perspective, believe it or not, you know, we have great, great bones here. Uh, you know, uh, we have this legacy of sustainability. We have willing partners at the state. Uh, that is good news. Um, they are eager to help us. They are eager to find ways uh, for us to help them, uh, you know, and make a bigger difference. We have super passionate and committed faculty and students and staff, uh, you know, as evidenced by the fact that you all are here today. Uh, we have innovative research, you know, and uh, we have this council, right? Uh, we have this work that we're going to do right now, helping to chart uh, a new path for us. Uh, so, you know, um, this is big stuff. There are big things we can move. Uh, you know, if, if Carl's talked about the academic side, you know, the lieutenant governor's talked about the big picture, let me talk nuts and bolts, you know, because at the end of the day, this is real stuff, you know, uh, too. So uh, I heard a stat the other day. Uh, talking to folks who work in sustainability, and it was that 40% of emissions come from commercial real estate, you know, and commercial buildings and stuff. Uh, this is less inspirational sounding, or maybe a little more nuts and bolts, but acknowledge who I am, right? I'm the bean counter dude. 40% of emissions coming from these, uh, these types of facilities. Well, we're the biggest commercial facility owner in the entire state of Wisconsin. Uh, we have 26 million square feet. We have 450 buildings. That's just on the main campus. We have 13,000 acres of land all around the state uh, that also have impacts and need stewardship. Uh, you know, we have some of the biggest heating and, and uh, uh, cooling and utility infrastructure in the state. Uh, so things that we do here really do matter. They matter in Wisconsin. They matter on a global scale. And we are really looking forward to your input, your feedback, your ideas, your creativity on how we move this forward together. Uh, I know I speak for the, the provost and the chancellor when I say we're really excited for this work you're gonna do. Uh, we know you're gonna knock it out of the park. Uh, each of you, please bring your A game to this stuff. Uh, we need you, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Heller. Sorry I didn't get a chance to introduce you, but I did note that you have an eclectic knowledge of music that is um, a little bit intimidating, so. You're one of the most down-to-earth administrators I've ever worked with, and you're, it's, it's easy to talk to you. So for all of our students and everyone else on the, on the council, um, we have two of the best leaders in higher ed. We're really happy to have you. 
Um, I'm going to take three minutes and 20 seconds, which Alex allocated to me, to do a, a little wrap up, and then we're going to go into a debrief. I'm going to shut my video off for a minute. Bring this up. Oops. This one. All right. In June of 2018, I was at the University of Illinois attending a seminar on emerging contaminants in the water. And I sat with a graduate student from UW-Madison who was there to present her findings on chemicals clinging to microplastics in the water. One year later, I, was, I had taken a position here and I was embarking on the Wisconsin IDEA seminar with 40 new faculty and administrators. That week began with Bill Quackenbush, the Ho-Chunk tribal historian, walking us out to Picnic Point, having us sit at the fire circle, close our eyes and envision the lake through Ho-Chunk memories. He described crystal clear waters and white sand, white sand. Um, and with our eyelids still closed, tribal members drummed and sang a welcome song for us. And we were asked, or we were told, about how the sound of the music and the voices would carry across the water. And you could see and hear tribal neighbors all around the lake. Bill shared a tribal memory with us that morning but it is also a vision and a mission, and he delivered it with a clarity that these lakes once had. The history of sustainability at this institution didn't begin with the 2010 task force report, with Earth Day in 1970, or even with the founding of the institution in 1848. The history of sustainability here goes back 10,000 years, and that is a legacy, is something to honor and embrace. We often talk about systems approaches and sustainability, and it's nothing more than a means of describing incredibly complex relationships, removing the artificial linearity that we often impose on ourselves. So I'd like to take or to tell a little story of an imaginary yet plausible system. So let's go back and start with our microplastics. These particular microplastics are textile fibers from our carpets and clothing dispersed through the air and water through the nastiest of vectors, our laundry appliances. And then our heroes step in. Assistant Professor Wee from engineering is developing ways to use light to remove the contaminants. And Professor Sarmadi from SOHI is developing textiles that are less toxic and safer for the environment. And then let's say we partner with Under Armour and we bring in our friends at Wharf to patent athletic gear that is non-toxic and doesn't shed fibers and it's extra slippery so our wide receivers and our running backs are contributing to clear lakes while adding points to the scoreboard. And then let's say we take that textile revolution and patent even further and use it for our commencement robes. Um, <laughs> You know, when you look at the amount of additional fabric that's required to cover JJ Watts, that's significant. And then our alumni can carry forth that vision and clean other waterways of plastic. And that is the example of a systems approach. It's leveraging our strengths and sharing our badger spirits. You are architects of our future, this council, and I want you to use our history and long held memories to bring clarity and purpose to our mission. We've fallen behind, but we have not fallen apart. And together, our work here will put UW-Madison back to where they belong. All right. And now, um, Vice Chancellor Heller and Provost Schultz, we're going to move into a team debrief. You are more than invited to join us. We're going to break out into some smaller spaces and also try to capture the council's vision of what the university could be. Um, as I said, I know Provost Schultz has to leave. Vice Chancellor Heller, you are more than invited to stay, or obviously, um, I know you're a busy man because being Vice Chancellor uh, during the time of a pandemic is an added burden. Sadly, there are one or two things going on. <laughs> I can't wait to hear all about the great work y'all are doing here. And thank, thank you all very, very much for the work that you're doing. Thank you both. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Alex and Deb. Go Thanks, ahead, Missy, um, and good morning to everyone. So we're going to take about 10 minutes to talk about the presentations that you just heard and connect them to the work of the council. Um, we'll use the focus conversation process uh, that you talked about in the pre-meetings, and we'll break up into smaller groups for this discussion. Each room will have a facilitator who will also take notes for your group. We'll start with introductions. Um, you'll say your name, your unit, and some, share something about your favorite quarantine activity. So that'll sound something like this. 
I'm Deb Gerke. I work in the office of, uh, where do I work? The office of, <laughs> of consult, of, of, I forgot where I work, the office of strategic consulting. I had a senior moment there, sorry guys. And my favorite quarantine act is working in my garden. Um, there are four types of questions. The first is what words or phrases jumped out at you from the speaker's presentations. And here you're identifying what was said that you noticed. The Lieutenant Governor said X, the Provost said Y, uh, the Vice Chancellor said Z. You only have to name one, but we ask that you either paraphrase or directly quote what you heard them say. The next two questions, what words or phrases jumped out at you from the speaker's present, or I'm sorry, what was exciting about what you heard and where do you have concerns? Here we're looking for reactions. What were you happy to hear? What made your, fur your brow furrow? And something could make, some, make you do both. We've all been in the situation where we say, well, on the one hand, X, but on the other hand, Y. So that's possible that, that could happen to you here. And the third question is, what do these presentations suggest to you about your role on the SAC? How are you going to use this, what you heard, to inform your work? And then the final question is, what is one insight or practice that you would offer for doing this kind of work together? So this question is looking for action. How can you use what you heard in your work in the council? We will come back as a large group and we'll share one important point from each of the groups. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? Seeing none, Alex, work your Zoom magic. Can I request to go back to the seat so we can take a photo shot of what's on there? There will be, um, in each group, a screen share of the note taker will share with the questions. Thank you. Sorry if I have to cut any folks off um, in, in the middle of the conversation. But, Deb, you We're want to take back. Okay. We're back. <laughs> We're back. I think our group could have talked for about 10 more minutes. <laughs> Deb, are you back? I'm back. We have everybody? <clears throat> we should. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do to wrap this up is just share um, something that was important that the group talked about. And I'll kick it off and then work our way through the groups. So in our group, uh, we thought what was most important to share was what we were going to do together, what we're going to take forward to this. And we said three things. Listen, listen, and listen. Take it all in. Uh, that we need to pay attention for opportunities for collaboration and linkages the personal networks and think about who else should be part of our conversation. And then um, something that uh, Lieutenant Barnes says, was Lieutenant Governor Barnes says, was intentionally include people who have not always been included. So as we go out to talk about this work, to, to be intentional about that piece. Um, so that's our group. I'm going to hand it over to Missy to share from her group. Thank you. Um, my group was patient with me because I had technological issues. Uh, so lots of inspiration from really the, the bigger picture um, from the state perspective and really placing the institution within that and what the responsibilities for that means and as far as our own accountability. And let's see, there was um, some surprise at the sheer size of the institution and the impact of our built environment. And then we walked away with a sense of responsibility and some excitement for the opportunities for collaboration. Thanks, Missy. Nathan, how about you? Uh, yeah, so we, um, I also had some technological issues, so my people weren't able to see the questions, but um, we had a really good conversation, mainly about the first couple. And uh, I would say to summarize that there was a lot of excitement about the um, opportunity and the, ment the momentum behind this, the number of stakeholders who are involved and who are kind of pushing for UW-Madison to be a leader. Um, there was also, I think, interest in the kind of deep time connection that Missy made to the history of sustainability um, in this space. 
um, and on this landscape. And, uh, you know, some concern about uh, maintaining optimism and moving forward and how, how we can do that, given that there are a lot of other things on people's plates. How do you also kind of consider stewardship for the planet? Um, but uh, I think everyone is, is feeling excited about the opportunities we have. Okay, great. Josh, you're up. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Josh Arnold with the Office of Sustainability. I had the pleasure of talking with some of our student subcommittee uh, representatives. And uh, the messages that, that we want to share out as a group included that there's a lot of talent and a lot of interest uh, from students and that our students on the subcommittee felt like one of their main jobs was making sure that we have um, communication channels to the student uh, body to have uh, conversations about um, uh, these types of issues. Uh, they also wanted to make sure that um, that students were holding administrators accountable to action. Um, and that as we develop our plan, they suggested that we um, be sure to include diverse voices, but also include flexibility in our plan to account for um, new voices as they arise and also, of course, unforeseen circumstances that come up. So thank, thank you to the students. Thanks, Josh. And Tracy, last but certainly not least. Yep. Hello. I had uh, the opportunity to hear from the students as well. Um, and one thing that I would like to share is they talked about, you know, really remembering why we're doing this. Um, in Lieutenant Governor's presentation, he talked about that we're doing this for our lives and the lives of our generations to come. Um, and so we, there really needs to be this openness to solutions, you know, whether it's expensive um, or, you know, there's many barriers around that just to be really open to that. And then they also discussed how there really needs to be a safe place in these meetings for everybody's opinions and perspectives to be heard. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tracy. All right, well, thanks to everyone for, I know this was a short conversation. We'll be having lots more over the time we have uh, over the next uh, rest of the academic year. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Missy. All right, Alex, you're driving the train. It's not a train. There's no linear tracks in this. All right, so things we wanted to talk about was how we got here. Um, and it's a way longer conversation than we have time for today. Uh, one of the things I do really enjoy is doing forensic analyses of processes, but uh, we'll get into that as we move forward into some of our future discussions. What I think and I saw in one of the quick notes was that um, not acknowledging uh, the harm that we've done in, in, our, in our West, as particularly in our Western culture as we move forward. So I refer to our, our indigenous heritage and that 10,000 years of memory that we have and how small we are on the time frame. And I think Lieutenant Governor Barnes alluded to this too, right? We often think, especially in Western cultures, in very short term time frames. Our economic systems, our political systems, they're all in short time frames. We're really wanting to take a long game in this approach. And part of the issue with that is our own mental models. And so we have a conflation of sustainability as strictly environmental and the environment as a system that's apart from humans. And I'd like, I'd like for you over the course of the next year and beyond to really think about how that informs then what we do moving forward. So one of the things we, we pride ourselves on as an institution is some of our environmental legacy. So uh, I think it was Vice Chancellor Heller even identified, or actually it was Provost Schultz, you know, Aldo Leopold and John Muir, some of our, our, our strong environmental advocates, they were also incredibly racist. And that is, um, that is a conflict that we need to address as we move forward. Uh, we can't do, create a solution over here that's going to have a negative impact across all of these areas. Sustainability really is about optimizations. You can't create this and then have to fix all of these things. It takes effort, time, resources, it's hurtful. Um, it impacts all of us, especially over time. So I really want to check our mental models. That being said, as architects, you have an opportunity and a responsibility 
to bring all of these things together. And that's why we, you know, that's why we have your diversity of expertise. Everyone here has an umbrella, um, executive umbrella that all of these programs and things run up under. And we all know that they are not isolated, isolated and compartmentalized. Um, and sustainability as does diversity creates this ginormous umbrella and gives us opportunities to integrate in a really robust way. So as we move forward, and Alex, you can click to the next slide. We're going to refer quite often to the 2010 task force report. Not that this is the point where we started, but it's really the first time that the institution sat down and, and created a strategy. And your, our job as the council, your job is to develop that strategy, incorporate those new ideas, take in the voices. One of the things that we do when we develop plans, um, we end up putting them on the shelf. That is not what we want to do. But one of the things that we've noticed is that we have not incorporated how humans interact. Um, there's a dynamic with humans that is not part of our change management approach in any of these previous strategies. That being said, there's a huge amount of work on here in this, in this initiative. And several of the folks that worked on this task force report in 2010 are also on our council. So we're really, really glad to have you here, your perspectives, and for you to help us identify where things went wrong, right? So we don't, we don't continue to make those same mistakes. So Alex, if you can click to the next one. So systems approach, all of our problems are connected. All of our solutions are connected. And this is something we really want to keep in the forefront of our mind. In 1973, um, two landscape architects actually developed the term, coined the term wicked problems. They're super complex problems where you can't just flip a switch and it's going to fix poverty or address domestic violence or address affordability and access. There are a lot of different things that go into that. And it's hard and it's exhausting. We can all feel just from this last 10 months of having to deal with this pandemic, um, which has exposed so many vulnerabilities across our systems. It's exhausting. So one of the things we also need to remember as we move forward is that sustainability is often, <laughs> we often use a sense of urgency in these dire consequences and it's oppressive. Humans do not respond well to that continue um, it feels hopeless, right? So one of the things we wanna make sure of is that we embed and take into account how we feel and how we interact. So each of you in your own spaces, for instance, have made those spaces comfortable and familiar with yourselves, for yourselves. Um, we've taken the opportunity to find and create places of respite that we normally, you know, we go, we go onto campus and we live in uh, rooms that are painted we call it badger white, <laughs> but it creates an institutional approach. And that's one of the things we're gonna look at across our institution is how do we make that a welcoming, equitable environment for everyone? And then, Alex, can you flip to the next one? When we talk about temporal timeframes again, we're talking about our strategic framework. Our framework goes from 2020 to 2025, and we're gonna align everything we do within the mission of higher education but we've also been charged by a vice chancellor and provost to look beyond that, to look long-term. So everything we do has to align with this, but it also has to look to the future. And one of the things that we're gonna be doing is looking at what our peers have done. And we're gonna be taking some of those ideas and saying, hey, does this fit with Madison? And that's great, but going after only what our peers have done only brings us up to the level of our peers. So when you're thinking and going through and developing these strategies, think far ahead, think, I hate this cliche, think out of the box, right? What does Madison need to do, not only to catch up, but to leapfrog and take over and return us as an institution to the global leaders that we are? Can you advance again? I should just see click. So one of the things the chancellor has signed on to that we're going to be working in concert with and that is being led by Josh Arnold from our office is resilience. The chancellor came under some pressure really to, to make a commitment, to make a commitment to carbon neutrality by a certain date or renewable energy by a certain date. And she was really reluctant to do that um, because it's difficult to make, uh, actually it's easy to make a commitment, it's hard to get there. 
So she's also taking a long-term approach and she signed us up for something, this resilience commitment that is really achieving multiple objectives with a comprehensive plan. So we're not just looking at a simple thing, carbon neutrality, we're looking at carbon neutrality and um, stormwater management and public health and poverty and all of these things built up in a community regional effort. And you can see we're just starting out on this. So our first year is the advisory council. We are, we're working on some objectives. And Alex, if you flip to the next slide, we're trying to achieve multiple things, multiple, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm being gentle with myself. So we're trying to do 10 things with one. So we don't want to just do carbon neutrality. We want to look at how that impacts all of these other basically rating systems and ways that the university is evaluated. So we want to amplify and optimize what we do. And Alex, can you flip to the next one? And what happens is that we get really stuck in individual strategies and actions, which is great. We will capture all of those because that's just what humans do, right? We immediately want to go to a solution. We want to make sure that each of our solutions meets a broader priority. So our objective as a council is to identify what those priorities are. We'll capture all of those actionable items that we can implement over time, and those will inform our strategies. They'll also allow us a great deal of flexibility. So while we're going through this work, you may be really, really tempted to be like, ooh, let's do that, let's do that, let's do that. Grab that, throw it in a parking lot, but really focus on a broad enterprise level strategy for this institution. And I'm gonna turn it over to Alex to talk about the methodology that we're gonna to use to get there. But before we do, I just wanna take everyone, take a moment and breathe. Find artwork or something that brings you peace. Um, I tried to find more props in my office and I really couldn't. So uh, I found this chicken. <laughs> All right, now it's Alex's turn. <laughs> Thank you, Missy. Um, that was a nice little break. I enjoyed the artwork. I didn't come prepared with any myself, unfortunately. Um, so as Missy said, I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about um, how we plan to, to get to some you know, priorities, ultimately some recommendations to the provost and, and the vice chancellor. And I think many of you have seen this purposely very busy um, chart before, but really um, we just wanna step back and say, we have a starting place. So this is um, STARS. STAR stands for Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System. And this is the kind of sustainability reporting tool that's developed by an organization called the Association for Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. It's a well-adopted tool by, by many schools um, across the country and across the world um, with the intention of using this to track progress of sustainability effort, uh, efforts, specifically at institutes of higher ed. We, um, in the Office of Sustainability, led the completion of our campus's um, first STARS report, which was just completed uh, late last year. Um, and we received a silver ranking um, in, the, in that report. So STARS provides their results on this scale of bronze, silver, gold, platinum. So um, as you can guess, silver is very encouraging, but it shows that we are lagging. Um, you can see here that the, the majority of the Big Ten schools um, that have completed um, a STARS report have received that gold or higher ranking. I might also add that the majority of other schools have completed this assessment multiple times. So um, we both have a gap in, in um, opportunities to improve the, this as a scoring mechanism, but, but also in to continue to do this and make this kind of reporting and tracking process more consistent. If you look at those kind of big categories within um, STARS, academics, engagement, operations, planning, administration, you can begin to compare ourselves to our, to our peers and start to identify um, areas of opportunities simply through, through this tracking metric. And we can go even into way more detail and into each subcategory, compare ourselves to Big Ten schools, system schools, every school that's ever done a STARS report. I'm a data guy, this sort of stuff, I get really excited and geeked out about. Um, but we're not gonna do this now. We're not gonna take the time to dive into this. Um, this is really to, to say in the past few slides, um, to say that in future meetings, we will have a chance to dive into some of these details. And we have some learnings and a place to say, where we're doing okay compared to our peers and where we have opportunities to um, improve ourselves um, compared to our peers. 
It also means we have an opportunity to learn from our peers, perhaps bring them in to help share some, some best practices and, and learn about that. But as Missy said, what our peers do is just to get up to our peers. We also want to push and think outside of the box beyond this. So if STARS is a, is a framework for at least us to have a benchmark and a way to start to compare ourselves and understand where our, our opportunities are, what the heck is a priority um, when we say priority? Um, this is an example of what a priority could look like. Um, basically, to, to us, as we're thinking about priorities, we want to define it as an action statement that, that describes some sort of desired or intended outcome. And then as Missy said, we wanna make sure we support that action statement with the, what we'll call initiatives, these things that we could do um, to ultimately meet that um, desired outcome. That one was research, this is procurement. There's a tons of opportunities that we could start to think about that could be a, a priority um, for us to pursue. Now, there are many priorities for us to consider, um, but again, um, that's for a couple meetings from now. We don't want to dive into that yet. Um, immediately for our next um, discussion when we come together in November, um, we want to talk about how we are going to make decisions as a team and how we can start to compare something like investing time and effort in procurement versus investing time and effort in, in, in research. And so um, while we'll dive into this in detail um, in, our, in our next meeting, um, we wanna put out this kind of initial framework on focusing on kind of two components of these priorities, impact and feasibility. So with um, impact, we could be talking about how a priority advances our institutional mission, meets our state's goals, um, places us at the forefront uh, uh, of an issue, improves our star score, whatever, whatever that might be. Feasibility, same thing. It could be um, the, the cost, how much time it would take to do it. Um, are our campus stakeholders ready? Are our community stakeholders ready? Is the technology ready for us to take this on? There's lots of things and we'll dive into that. But we think we wanna orient ourselves around those um, two kind of ideas. Really with, with the hope being that this will help us at least qualitatively start to rate and rank these priorities on these two um, axes of impact and feasibility. And then that will give us a structure as a way to start to visually represent and start to show what priorities jump out to us as the most important, as those things we wanna include as the highest priority for recommendations for the university um, to focus our, our, our collective resources and efforts behind. So um, I've laid out a lot of things to do. Many of you have seen some timeline. This is a slightly different version of our timeline, but it's, it's not different than any, see, anything you'd seen before. Um, really, the first thing we're going to do is focus on how we're going to make decisions as a group. Um, so that is this discussion, laying the framework of why we're doing the work that we're doing. And then our next meeting in November, where we'll dive into that structure and how we want to think about what fe feasibility and impact are. From there, our next meetings, we're going to transition and dive into each one of those areas as defined in STARS. Again, STARS is just our framework. The goal of this is not to just get a better STARS score. We're simply using that as a way to help frame how we're discussing um, what sustainability opportunities and what sustainability priorities we could consider. So we'll start um, talking about um, priorities in the academic space, then engagement, then operations, and then planning and administration. From there, we hope to have some, some decisions at the end of those meetings that will be preliminary, um, but ultimately get us towards our, our final step, which would be to finalize some sort of, uh, of recommendations that we can get back to the, the provost and the vice chancellor. Um, the other thing I wanna call out that, that's on here, um, we have two scheduled um, all-campus uh, virtual listening sessions, so open to students, staff, faculty, alumni, community members. Um, one that actually scheduled for next week, which is really to help get input and thought on our decision-making process. What are those things that we should consider when we're trying to make um, our, our priority decisions? So um, those will be coming up shortly. And then we've got another listening session scheduled um, as we get closer to the end when we have some preliminary recommendations to get that feedback on, does this feel right? What are we missing? What jumps out as exciting, as concerning from our campus community? Again, I think to reiterate something, I think that Deb, Deb's group said, make sure we're, we're keeping as much space and opportunity for us to listen, to listen, and to listen. Uh, the um, last um, thing I wanna call out um, on here is that um, 
what you don't see are the student subcommittee meetings. So um, we are extremely lucky to have a committed group of students uh, supporting us in this work um, as well. So they will be meeting in between um, our um, council uh, meetings, um, primarily with the goal of providing feedback and comment immediately after um, our meetings. So if there's anything that um, is of interest that we wanna get count that they can provide comments or feedback on, we can get that immediately. But that also helps support um, the student members on the council to make sure that they come prepared with as many student viewpoints as possible uh, to that discussion. Michael, I see you have a, a raised hand. Is there something you'd like to, to ask? Yeah, I just had a question about um, when we're going into the meetings 12, 18, 1, 12, and we're talking about those specific categories in which we can um, make improvements or do evaluations, mm -hmm. are we going to have the STARS report that the university got available to us that we can kind of look at beforehand and come with thoughts and opinions? Definitely. Um, so we'll be able to, we'll provide a few things in advance of those meetings. Um, the STARS report it is available or make sure we'll get that to you here, here shortly, shortly after this, this meeting. Um, we also have done um, a, a gap analysis where we've compared ourselves. So that big chart that showed us compared to a lot of different uh, of our peers, there's some further detail on that we can provide that shows those areas where we're, we're lagging and where we're doing well. Um, but then also we will come um, prepared with some of at least initial thoughts on priority areas as well. So we're not starting from a complete blank slate. Thanks. Um, so my last comment here is really just to echo something that I know that we heard uh, multiple times when we met with the, the council members one-on-one. -on -one. And that is to make, make sure that the, the work we're doing is really always driving towards action, right? While I'm sure and we envision at the end of our, at least our first year here together, we will come away with some form of a, a report, a document or something that, that summarizes our work. We don't view the completion of a fancy looking report as a successful um, mission for this council, right? Um, success comes from how that um, and how our collaborations together um, drive action um, and progress on our campus. And as Missy said, you know, we can look to our peer universities as um, places to identify and adopt best practices, but that's only gonna bring us in line with them, right? So where we can find places to make um, old actions become our priorities and then actually realize and put the muscle behind those actions. That's what's I think most exciting to us. Um, these are just some initial ways in which we, we almost know that we will operationalize the work, right? So we will identify and find ways to support ways to collaborate both within and across divisions um, of our school, be able to apply a lot of um, the priorities we define here to our climate action planning development process incorporated into communications, events that maybe even someday will be in-person events. Um, but really, I think that the biggest and most important thing is that we'd love for this council to help um, identify how else we can operationalize this. How else can we go from discussing and identifying the problems and identifying potential solutions to actually putting the resources and the effort behind it? So with that, I think we've just got a, a couple closing items. We're getting close to the end of our, our time here. So I'm gonna hand it over to Nathan, who's gonna talk a little bit about communications. And I think Missy will wrap it up for us. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, thank you all for hanging in through this first meeting. Um, already really excited to hear uh, all the conversation that we've had. Um, I'm the, uh, my name's Nathan Yondel. I'm the Assistant Director at the Office of Sustainability and I'm also, I also serve as our Communications Director. So I'll just mention very briefly here some of the communications um, items that we have on tap. Uh, internally, there is a um, SAC Communications Google Drive that you should have access to at this point. Uh, we will post uh, materials and share things via that drive. Um, Coming out of each of these meetings, there will be executive summaries, which will be distributed directly to you all. Uh, we will also be sharing those summaries as well as the recordings of these meetings and the agendas on our dedicated SAC website, which you'll see down on the uh, external section of this slide here. Um, we're looking for as much transparency as possible in this process, and we think we thought uh, executive summary plus recording was a good way for people to get the overview and then dive in really deeply if they'd like to for those who are not able to um, be part of the council or the subcommittee. Um, 
questions and concerns, especially about internal matters to the council, you can direct them to Alex, uh, though certainly uh, I and others will be available too. Um, from an external communication standpoint, we're still working, I'd say, on what we might consider a strategy, but I, if I were to underline one thing is that we would love your input on how we can leverage the work we're doing here on the SAC to its best advantage across campus for different constituencies and audiences within your divisions, your schools, your peer groups. Um, we will certainly be sharing out updates via our newsletter on social media and so forth. We'll be updating the SAC website, which still has a little bit of updating to be done. And I'll flag that and say, by the way, if you haven't um, submitted a uh, headshot and a little uh, bio of yourself, I would love to have that so I can um, update you on our SAC membership page. Um, but so the, the website will serve as one of the portals. And then again, we'll be using some other typical communication channels for getting out other information. And uh, as I say, um, any thoughts that you all have, I know at least some of you work in communications, but it actually doesn't matter. Anybody who has thoughts on how we can best make the work of this council um, animated for the, the larger community, please let us know. And I think that's it for me. Um, and I'll hand it back to Missy. All right. Thank you um, in honor of everyone's time. One couple of reminders, we'd invite everyone to let your stakeholders know about the listening sessions. We're going to publicize them in a lot of different areas. They've actually gone out in several different channels already and we'll continue to push that. Um, we're going to read lots by email. Nathan's sending me a note, got it. <laughs> so take some time, do some reflection. Um, Come to the listening sessions yourself. You are obviously very invited. And then we will be sending out some invitations for the next meetings in November. We're adjusting those a little bit to accommodate some student class schedules. And I think that's it. I really just want to thank you. We, we have a big job ahead of us and I can't imagine doing it with a better group of people. So we're really looking forward to these opportunities. On behalf of Kathy and myself and the rest of the team, thank you. All right, everyone can go on your happy ways. Thank you so much. This was an excellent meeting. This is Nola. Thank you so much. I, it feels, I feel charged and inspired and excited. Um, I would say that from beginning to end, this was a model, um, I think, launch for a council. It was excellent. It, it just communicated, hopefully, all your intentions. It was just wonderful. So I receive it. I'm excited. My burning question is, when are we meeting again? <laughs> <laughs> November 10th at 830, the, you'll see an invite hit your, hit your inbox here, hopefully, in the day today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.